Hello, hello. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning, all. We are going to give a few minutes for any latecomers to kind of just join us. Uh, so we will start promptly at 1032. But welcome as well. Hey, I'm, I know there's still people joining, but we'll go ahead and get started just to be mindful of everyone's time. Um, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Um, I know this is a really quick turnaround for a bidders conference, so we appreciate you um, joining us this morning to hear about um, this procurement opportunity. I'm joined by my colleague, Sadia Chance, who's going to take you through the majority of this um, bidders conference. Um, I'm just gonna kick us off. Uh, my name is Rebecca Ambrose. I'm the director of training and apprenticeship at Philadelphia Works. I oversee um, all of our apprenticeship work as well as our training initiatives, which includes our vocational skills training as well as our individual training accounts, um, working closely with Sadia and the team um, to help with all things ETPL, eligible training provider list, and working really closely with the PA Career Links um, to ensure that Philadelphia residents um, are connected to training that leads to quality jobs, quality careers, family sustaining wages, um, and is really setting them up for success. Um, so we'll kick things off. Um, I just wanna say, if you all have questions as we go through, feel free to come off mute if you wanna ask or drop it in the chat. Um, our colleague David is monitoring the questions in the chat, so we'll be able to see those. Um, and if there's anything else that you have questions about as we go through, we'll have time at the end, but don't hesitate to just jump in and ask if you have something in the moment. Um, so we'll just, I'm going to give an overview of Philadelphia Works Training Initiatives. Um, so this table here outlines kind of a nice um, how we think about our uh, training at Philadelphia Works. So on the left side, you'll see employer-driven training opportunities. This is essentially um, training opportunities that are driven by employers, that are driven by companies looking to train um, their staff or new hires. So we have a repository of training providers and um, their known expertise and we're able to connect those two um, employers that are looking for training, upskilling, um, you know, more specific training opportunities. Um, so training providers that we've contracted with or that are on the ETPL, we're able to, you know, have them in our repository. Um, at the bottom, you'll see individual student tuition assistance. Um, this is through the eligible training provider list, which we manage for the County of Philadelphia. Um, other counties and other workforce boards have their ETPL, which is across the whole state. Um, so the state of Pennsylvania has an ETPL. Um, we just manage it for Philadelphia. And this allows through our ITAs, individual training accounts agreements, um, allows students that are coming through the PA career link to get connected to job specific um, training programs. And the one that we're talking about today is highlighted in the darker blue. This is our contracted cohort-based skills training. So this is done through procurement multiple times a year. We've had some staff transitions over the last year. So um, this is our first procurement in about a year, I want to say. Um, but we're really excited to get back into a schedule that will allow for multi 
um, phases, um, more procurements throughout the year. So we're excited to talk about this one with you all. And I think the next slide will go into what this RFP, what this procurement looks like. So we're looking for proposals from entities seeking to operate cohort-based training programs. This would be for adult career seekers in the public workforce system. Um, so really looking at the vocational skills training model, this is a cohort-based training. So you, um, the training provider, the organization, the entity would be training a cohort of adult learners, um, and they would be um, sourced and recruited from the PA career link. So we'll get into that um, a little bit more, but really want to focus on the eligible training programs that are being proposed, uh, that we're looking for in this procurement. So the programs must meet the following standards, lead to an industry recognized credential. Um, I really wanna make a point here that industry recognized credentials um, are specific credentials. They are not um, you know, completion based. Um, they're not certificates of completion. They actually lead to an industry recognized credential upon the completion of training. Um, and we'll share some examples later on. They should incorporate seamless pipelines and pathways to employment for graduates. So we're also really focusing on the um, pathway for the customer, for the student. So looking at the not only the, the quality of the training, which is definitely important, but also looking at that pathway. So where does the student go after they complete training? And the, you know, what we're looking for is that connection to employment. So making sure that training providers have employer partners that are willing and committed to interviewing and hiring graduates of the program. Um, and lastly, they prepare learners for success in one of the identified recovery occupations, which we'll talk about in just a minute. So the um, industries that we're focusing on for this procurement are below in this slide, um, healthcare, clean energy, maintenance, and manufacturing. So we've outlined um, each of these in, within the RFP. So you can read through in the RFP um, our explanation for each of these. Um, clean energy, I just want to draw everyone's attention to, um, is a newer industry for us and a newer industry that has a lot of interest across the nation right now and a lot of investment. Um, and this is really um, broad in a lot of ways because there's multi, there's subsectors, there's kind of like multi um, industries underneath it, so to speak. Um, so this one, we have um, a little bit more details in the actual RFP just about how you can propose trainings and uh, programs that might align to clean energy. Um, additionally, healthcare, maintenance and manufacturing, there's an overview. We list um, specific occupations that provide examples and trainings um, for these industries as examples, um, but are open to um, other occupations within those um, main industries. So just wanted to call out that these are the industries that we're looking for at the moment. Um, if something doesn't fall within these industries, it will not be considered um, and we will not review your proposal. Um, so I wanna focus on recovery occupations. Um, if any of you are familiar with Philadelphia Works, you've heard us talk about recovery occupations before, um, but just to give an overview, we identified recovery occupations um, during the pandemic um, and have updated this list um, in the years since. So the criteria for recovery occupation is that it's on the high priority occupation list, the HPO, um, that is on our website if you wanna look through that list. Um, a recovery occupation pays $15 an hour or more. It has minimal impact to employment during the pandemic. The local labor supply gap or opportunities um, are, you know, really high. So we're really looking to see, will people be able to find employment within these industries? Um, and a focus on middle to low skill jobs with opportunities for advancement. So starting at an entry level position um, and then moving along in that uh, specific career or that specific industry and a strategic focus on timely jobs requiring less than associate's degree. 
so low skill um, that are able to get in without, you know, advanced degrees, without a bachelor's degree. So really looking at um, how we can train folks into these um, careers and into these um, career advancement opportunities. We have more information on the recovery occupations that we can share out with you all. And um, again, the high priority occupation list is on our website. Um, so as I mentioned before, the vocational skills training model, the VST, we love acronyms around here. The VST model um, is a specific training program model um, that must have the following program, sorry, must have the following already included within the proposed training. So again, a cohort-based training, training a group of individuals. Um, it provides supportive enrollment and educational experiences for the paid career-link customers. Um, and it leads to obtaining an industry-recognized credential for entry-level employment without a post-secondary education. Um, again, a lot of this is covered in the RFP around, you know, and we will go into details around what we're looking for specifically with the trope the training program model, um, but just really wanna emphasize that the vocational skills trainings are cohort based. You'll be working collaboratively with us and the PA Career Link to place PA Career Link customers into training. And we really wanna focus on that the training leads to an industry recognized credential. All right, so basic applicant eligibility. An eligible applicant um, can be an organization that includes any of the following, for-profit, non-profit, educational institution, um, and or government entity. Um, again, really wanna focus um, that proposals that accumulate in only basic certifications or certificates of completion will not be considered. Um, we will mark them as non-responsive and will not be reviewed. If you have questions around industry recognized credentials, um, if you wanna you know, ask us, hey, I have this, credential? Is this an industry recognized credential? We're happy to answer those questions and um, and look through that. Um, but please be mindful that if it only accumulates in a basic certification or certificate of completion, it will not be reviewed. Um, and we will also do a financial review. Our fiscal team will review each applicant. So applicants must be in good financial standing. I also just wanted to add to piggyback or give an example about a basic certification. So, for example, if this had the industry for um, for maintenance and manufacturing, there is OSHA 10. OSHA 10 we will not accept, but OSHA 30 is acceptable as a industry recognized credential. So basic qualifications, CPR, AD training, no, but if it's more emergency technician, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Sidia. No problem. Um, so defining a strong applicant organization, um, here are some bullet points around what we're really looking for when it comes to applicants applying for this procurement opportunity. Um, the applicant should have a strong organizational experience, strong infrastructure, and robust staffing. Um, these contracts will go for a full year um, with multiple cohorts most likely. So we really wanna ensure that the applicant, that the organization, is able to um, take on this additional um, funding, take on the work associated with running a training program. And a big component of that is the organizational um, capacity. So really looking at all the um, people that it takes to run a program, making sure that the staffing um, is um, sufficient for running a program like this. We'll also be looking at competency-based training content and high quality course instruction. Um, again, ensuring that there are instructors, ensuring that the curriculum has been developed with industry partners, that it's been employer, um, there's been employer um, input into the curriculum, and really making sure that the training content is competency based and is a you know essentially a building block to reach that industry recognized credential at the end. Um, we're also looking for blended learning content informed by adult learning principles. Again, this is for adult uh, learners uh, within the Philadelphia area. So making sure that the course content, the curriculum is um, structured and is delivered in a way that is suitable for adult learners. Um, a really important piece I wanna focus on is the recruitment strategy. We're really looking for um, applicants that have a well-defined proactive recruitment strategy in student selection process. Um, again, 
uh, any awardee will be working closely with the PA career link to recruit and register folks from um, that uh, come through the PA career link. So really looking at that collaborative spirit, looking at a um, proactive and robust recruitment strategy. Uh, we're also looking at academic support throughout the course, including preparation for industry recognized credentials at the end. So this can include, you know, one-on-one -on -one tutoring, coaching, making sure that the learner has the supports they need to get through the training program, that there's resources available if they need upskilling, you know, in digital literacy, if they need support through, um, you know, adult basic education, that those um, supports are outlined and that they will be connected to those supports if needed. Um, looking for opportunities for the student to practice skills, preferably in a workplace setting. So this can be an internship or an externship, um, really something that allows them the ability and the opportunity to practice what they've learned um, in the workplace setting. So again, this really emphasizes the importance of having an employer partner um, that allows for this opportunity for the students. Um, and lastly, connections to industry experts and employment opportunities. So making sure that the um, industry and the employers have weighed in on curriculum, that it was built you know, collaboratively to ensure that once the student completes the program and receives the credential, that they are in a good position to interview and to seek employment within the you know, training that they just, within the industry that they just went through training for. Um, so these are, you know, definitely refer back to this list as you're, as you're placing, as you're um, working on your proposal um, for what we're looking for in a strong applicant and a strong proposal, excuse me, a strong proposal. And then, Sidia, did you want me to do this slide or you want to jump in? I can jump in okay. here. Um, so hello, everyone. I see some familiar faces, and then I also see some new ones. So again, thank you for joining us today. I'm going to dive right into collaborative partnership with our PA Career Link. I just want to really highlight that this funding is not for programs that are being built out or being developed right now. These are for programs that are currently existing and also able to service more students with additional funding. So for us, what we're looking for areas of collaboration is that you're facilitating uh, recruitment events with our PA Career Link customers. You can refer students to the PA Career Link. A lot of people qualify for WIOA uh, or maybe already enrolled in TANF funding streams that can utilize opportunities like this. So there is a portion where you can extern you can make an external referral, but most of these are coming from our PA career links and already connected. So facilitating recruitment events can look like you're doing on-site WIOA registration at your your school, or you're going into the PA career links and providing presentations on what your training program is and getting folks connected. Um, for those that are awarded, you will be working very closely with our education and training coordinators at each of our centers. We have about four. There's Northwest, North, um, Suburban Station, as well as West PA Career Link. You will have a point of contact for each of those sites to recruit and funnel information regarding your training programs, recruitment needs, um, requirements for enrollment, et cetera. Um, you're also assessing a potential customer's suitability for training. So you're setting those requirements. This is your program. We want you to have that ability to say, hey, based off of our employer needs or the employer partner we have, they're saying that you need a COVID-19 vaccination, FBI clearances. Our staff will help support those our customers in obtaining those clearances and in uh, requirements as needed, but you would set the tone for letting us know what requirements are needed for enrollment, um, as well as assessing if their literacy skills need to be at a certain level. We do provide CASAS testing. Um, we also have in the past provided, I'm not sure if others are familiar with the Wonderlic test, um, on site at our centers. So those are some opportunities to assess eligibility and literacy skills, but also to help students who may not have those high literacy skills obtain training opportunities as well, um, at a later time or work with them to kind of enter in these trainings programs. 
Um, you're communicating and managing enrollment logistics. Again, this is going back to what is needed to enroll, what documentation, uh, if there are scrubs needed for preparation, all of our staff will help support that, but you have to be the one who is leading and driving those communications to us. Um, monitor and report customer time and attendance, but also their performance within the course. You're proactively telling us, hey, Sadia's not showing up to class. I, she's been enrolled in our program, but she's missing this amount of class. And if, if she doesn't come, then we're gonna have to either let her go. All of those concerns in regards to time, attendance, performance, will need to be communicated and you'll be working with the PA career links to kind of really make sure that customers are succeeding within this program. Um, and you're also connecting customers to potential job opportunities and internships. So this again goes to that employer partnership, which is really crucial, making sure that they're able to at least interview uh, or hire within these organizations if they're doing internships outside of your organization or um, with your employer partner, also communicating their performance within those internships and job opportunities as well. You will also be required to track and monitor. Um, and when we say track and monitor, just more so tell us exactly who is working where. Once they've leave, left your program, if they've gained employment and gained employment within your field, that ties back into your outcomes and performance of your contract. So it is really crucial to be able to kind of keep the uh, ongoing engagement with customers after they leave your programs as well. We're now going to go into budget information and payment structures. So again, um, for all applicants that are submitting a proposal, you must complete the budget sheet, which is Appendix D, listed on our opportunities page, procurement opportunities page. Um, this payment structure is cost reimbursement. It is done on a monthly basis, so you will need to invoice and make sure that you're keeping up with your invoicing receipts on a monthly basis so that we can reimburse you for those costs. Um, we do not pay the funds up front. You must, again, this is cost reimbursement, so whatever that you pay to help operate the program, we will then support after you submit an invoice to us. Administrative costs, direct or indirect, cannot exceed 10% of the program expenses. So the total program expense um, admin cost has to stay either at 10% or under, um, but not over 10%. Your budget can also include laptops, tablets, staff travel, paid work experience, student um funds for students if you want to support FBI clearances and backgrounds within your budget, if you would like to support scrubs, if your student needs a, a specific software, um, this is more, this is, doesn't apply to our current RFP, but in the past we have done information technology and um, there have been budgets where there is a particular software program that needs to be installed onto a laptop. We will fund those um, and it can be included within your overall budget. Um, it is also for work-based skills, so it can include stipends for training. Some people would like to have that engagement to make sure that they're retaining talent um, throughout these programs. So if you would like to include a stipend for training, uh, certification fees, exam fees, or other developmental expenses, that can also be included within your budget as well. Um, following proposal determinations, once you are, once we make um, a determination in regards to awards or rejections, we will follow up with you individually. If you are awarded, a more detailed budget will be expected and developed through a negotiated conversation. That ha typically happens when you're onboarded. We'll go through a budget negotiation of what we will pay for, what are some of the costs that will fall on your end, um, or if there is any modifications that need to be made towards your proposed budget. Um, sorry. And again, providers will be required to adhere to, the, to all monthly reporting calls. So you have to, uh, again, you will be required to report monthly what are your expenses that you are paying out for this program and also balancing your own budgets on your end to make sure that you are staying within the allotted budget amount. Any questions right now in regards to budget and contract information? Great. 
So here is a snapshot of our budget sheet. As you can see where it says provider name, we've made a uh, dupe of this. So it would be your organization's name, the training program that you are proposing, the length of the budget if it's only a six month program. Um, typically we, we see a lot more nine to 12 months depending on how many cohorts you're looking to serve. Uh, but you have a length budget uh, choice of six, nine or 12 months. The total number of students you're proposing that you would like to um, host within your training program, the cost per student, as well as the total budget. I do wanna highlight that although the co total cost per student is listed here on this budget, we do not pay for VST programs by per student. It is the overall operating cost that we're looking to pay. We pay for the credentials, we pay for any expenses that will help operate the program, but not the per student itself, if that makes sense. For data management and performance. Uh, so again, you'll be working with our education and training coordinators on the ground. You will proactively update PA Career Link and Philadelphia Works, which would be your program liaison. So you'll either be working with myself or another colleague um, to discuss students' training status. Um, you will also be required to report on student training status as well. So if they are active, completed, or terminated from your program, we will need to know before that actually occurs. Um, this is also captured within your monthly reports. That monthly report will detail if a student has reached a milestone, if they have completed the training, when did they complete the training, when did they start training, when are they expected to end training. All of that information needs to be captured within your monthly report and shared with our data team as well. Um, you will also share students' credentialing status and employment status upon completion, as well as up to 60 days post-completion. So again, being able to capture who is reaching those milestones within your program is really important for us, as well as that employment status even after they've completed your program. Are you still keeping in touch with these students? Are you still supporting them with obtaining employment um, or being prepared to enter within work within that industry? Uh, copies of the credentialings are required for invoicing and data reporting. So it's really essential that you are capturing this information throughout the time the students are in your program, as well as 60 days post completion of your program. Um, and again, it is maintaining a working partnership with the PA Career Link staff to ensure that the state's database actively reflects. So there will be times where we'll be reaching out to you, some information that we're, if we're capturing all of our students, uh, just making sure that we're updating and making sure we're on the same page um, for what is entered on the PA Career Links level to what is actually being captured during the training program as well. Additional supporting documents that you can provide within your um, proposals, all required appendices must be completed thoroughly and attached to your proposals. This means the cover sheet, performance summaries and outcomes, employer support form, and your budget sheet must also be completed in, in addition to your proposal. For performance summary and outcomes, the question I always get asked is, if I don't have performance outcomes for this particular program, but I may have it for a similar program, can I use that? Yes, you can submit this, we will review. However, we would like more performance out summary outcomes for the current program that you are proposing. Um, do please do not include copies of your organization's strategic plan. While it is helpful to know where your organization is going, it is not needed, um, but if you are if you do have a program implementation plan, or if you would like to include copies of your training curriculum or syllabi, those are also welcome as well. Now getting into the proposal submission and evaluation process. All proposals once received are sent to a review committee to then review, score, and make comments in regards to your proposals. Uh, the release of the RFP occurred on October 13th. Today is our bidders conference. After your bidders conference today, um, on the 20th, we will be posting the frequently asked questions. So any questions that are asked during today's presentation uh, will be posted on our procurement page. You will also receive a copy of this presentation along with the recording of this video. 
so that if you, let's say later, you have any other additional questions, you can feel free to send those into VST training at filloworks.org. And you'll see that later on within this presentation. The deadline for all proposals is November 22nd, 5 p.m. 5 p.m. November 22nd. <laughs> Please do not send it past 5 p.m. It may not be reviewed and will more than likely not be reviewed if sent after 5. Um, but any time beforehand can be is acceptable. If you would like to send it before this date, you can feel free to do so. Um, but the deadline for all proposals, again, are is November 22nd. Award determinations will be sent out in January. We do not have a solidified date as of yet but early January more so probably the first week you should hear something in regards to your proposal proposals must be submitted to again the VST training email at VST training at filloworks.org by Wednesday November 22nd at 5 p.m. Uh, the subject headline must read vocational skill training programs for adult learners within the public workforce system um, it must be single-sided, single-spaced, using one-inch margins, and no larger than 12.5. font. Um, one PDF. We're looking for one PDF comprising all components and attachments as well as an unlocked version, Excel version of Appendix D. Um, you must meet all the page limit requirements, and you must submit... Uh, if you are looking to submit for multiple programs, you must submit a proposal for each of those individual programs. Again, you can feel free to send us any questions, comments, concerns to our email at vsctraining at filloworks.org. And again, Q&As will be posted on Friday uh, the 20th on our Philoworks Procurement Opportunities page. Are there any questions of what I've reviewed thus far? I have a question. <laughs> Hi, Hi. Uh, Mary Jo from Perscolas. Perscolas, we offer free tech training, mm -hmm. not specific to healthcare or manufacturing. Um, and we offer different cohorts. One is IT support. It leads to industry recognized certification. Well, so would we, should we send a proposal or because we are not specific to the three areas, will that preclude us from qualifying? So I would not, being that these, this procurement cycle is focused on healthcare, clean energy, and maintenance and manufacturing, if your organization does not fall or programs do not fall within those three categories, I will wait out for this procurement cycle. There are other upcoming procurement opportunities that you will be, um, we'll keep you on our mailing list to remind you of. I see will probably be one of them in, in the future as of right now, it's just not for this RFP, sorry. Um, oh, nope, and that's why I'm... <laughs> no <laughs> But please feel free to look out for other procurement opportunities, but this cycle I wouldn't recommend uh, submitting proposal for unless there is a unique experience of how they may align with clean energy or one of the three occupations that we've identified. Okay, all right, thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> Bye. We have one question in the chat from Lindsay Robbins. Um, I can't see the chat. <laughs> Give me one second. Yeah, I'll read it. Yeah, I can just read it to you okay. and then just help you answer it. Um, so from Lindsay, when you say that each program must have a separate proposal, do you mean a separate proposal for a healthcare program and a separate proposal for a manufacturing program? Yes. Um, please submit different proposals. Um, so even if you have, if you want to apply two programs for the same industry, each program must be a separate proposal. Um, and then the follow-up question, how many program awards do you plan to give? Um, we don't have a set number. Um, that will determine, that will be based on the funding that we have available. So we'll look at all the proposals that we receive, what the proposed budget is, and then how that fits into our um, 
funding at the moment. So there's not a set number of awards that we plan to give out. We'll just look at it um, based on how many proposals we see, how many proposals we receive, and then how that fits into our funding for this fiscal year. I do want to add, it's also based on our scoring system. So if I review t your, this is a competitive procurement process. So a lot of your proposals, if, for example, if you're submitting within the healthcare industry and there are three other proposals within that healthcare that are submitted um, for procurement, they will be um, scored against each other to see what, uh, based off of our requirements set within this RFP, what would be the best proposal um, from our review team. They will complete a scoring sheet. This is very, um, it's kind of very detailed, making sure that we're going through all the questions that we we would like to capture uh, within this RFP. So based off of those, that feedback, we then make a determination um, against your score, your like, which is the highest score, which one has the best budget, um, which was completed as well. So there are the factors that will determine um, awards. Thanks, Lydia. Um, another question, is there a contract amount range or maximum award amount? Um, no, there isn't. We're just really looking for people to propose um, budgets. And again, we would look at this based on our funding. Um, I don't know, Sadia, if you, I guess it's hard because each program is so different. It really runs like the gamut of how much of you yeah. know the budgets that we see. Um, so we would just say propose a budget that feels you know accurate, that feels realistic to you. Um, but there's not you know a max or a minimum um, that we've outlined. So uh, we just ask that you you know submit something that feels you know we'll go through if if a program is awarded, we'll go through budget negotiations. So what you submit is not necessarily final. Um, but there is not um, a minimum or a maximum that you have to stay within those parameters for. Um, and then I, Diane, I, Diane, I'm going to come back to you because we will pass this over to Alyssa to talk about the additional training opportunities um, in just a minute. And one more question from Lindy. Does the offeror need to have their own location or can the program be offered at a career link location? Um, so do you want to let you answer? So, yeah. So, um, <laughs> currently we do not have the capacity to hold tr host trainings at the PA career link locations. So it would need to be at your own location or it, so, um, I do have providers that work with a third party, um, and may utilize a site. So if you do so, you can include that within your budget. Um, for example, I, I'm not sure if, if anyone has heard of the organization, you, Urban Affairs Coalition, I do have a provider that works with the Urban Affairs Coalition to utilize their computer lab. So if you are utilizing spaces as, like that um, to provide training, you can do so. Include that within your budget sheet. That is very important for us to know um, because when it comes down, if you are awarded and it comes down to contracting, there are some additional documentation we would need to su uh, support that contract. And I also see then another question is, what is the traditional expectation on the size of each cohort? It varies. So I have some cohorts as small as um, about five people, and then there are some as large as about 15. It really depends on how many you can host at a time and how many cycles that you are proposing that you would like to run within that year. If there are no other questions, I'm going to pass it off to my colleague, Alyssa Tumbler, who is going to discuss additional um, funding opportunities here at Philodox. And give me one moment to get to her slide. There we go. Hi, good morning, everyone. As Sadia mentioned, my name is Alyssa Tumbler. I'm a training solutions representative within the training and apprenticeship team. And I only wanted to take a couple minutes of of, of this time that is really focused on this specific proposal to share another opportunity. Um, uh, so the so I help to manage the William Penn um, Integrated Training Program. I'll say that I'll just set the expectation that this is a grant that we're in the early stages of planning. So this is not a proposal, um, but it's a training program that actually could 
most it in some cases might align to the work that you're already doing. And in that case, we would um, love to hear about it. And so if you are submitting a proposal that aligns to the goals and the expectations for the type of training program that we're building, we have um, a way that you can just let us know. It's a very um, short, there's actually a link to a, a very short questionnaire. It's three questions, it's who you are, um, and it's, you know, tell us a little bit about the program. Um, and I'll kind of get into the program's goals, but, you know, just again, wanted to emphasize that this is, you know, it's, this isn't a procurement opportunity, but it is something that we are, since we're in the early um, stages of planning, we um, wanted to make sure that we had a way of capturing some of the great work that you were doing and open up the door to some conversations. Um, so actually, Sita, if you could move to the next slide, please, or David, I'm not sure who's manning this. Um, so, so the, the, the program that we're trying, that we are building with, through this grant in many cases might be very similar to some of the things that are outlined within this procurement. Um, but something that's a little bit different is that we are, so we're training to roles that are, that lead to high quality entry level positions. Um, this can actually be outside of the industries that are included within this specific proposal. But the focus here is on high quality. So we're looking for jobs that, um, you know, they are at least $15 an hour. They have benefits. There are some other um, aspects of this that we kind of link to high quality that, of course, we could get into if if we kind of move forward with the conversation. Um, very similar to this procurement, we're looking for trainings that are really connected to a committed employer partner who at the end of that training have, you know, want to be hiring the folks who've gone through that training. And we're also looking for programs that are really targeted um, to candidates that are in high need areas within Philadelphia who might have one or more employment barriers. And those barriers might be, they may be single parents, they might have limited English proficiency, they might be justice impacted, or they might have a, um, a they might lack a high school diploma or equivalency. Um, the other aspects that we're looking for within a program is that there might be support for um, ways of reducing barriers to um, either participating, getting into training and succeeding in training. So that might be through integrated case management, free childcare, housing support. Um, the other piece that is actually um, probably different from this proposal is through the, um, is the inclusion of an integrated adult education. Uh, within the training program itself. So um, just higher, just um, bigger picture, the goal of this grant is really to be um, creating more connective adult education um, and workforce systems so that um, for individuals who haven't been able to participate traditionally in training programs, maybe their math or reading levels um, are, are a bit low and haven't been able to get into a program for that reason, or maybe they lack a GED, um, that they're, that these um, supports and upskilling are actually built within to the training program itself. Um, and, you know, again, we're kind of focused on populations of folks who haven't been able to make it into a training program or participate or really get connected to that high quality job. So looking for opportunities to be re removing some barriers um, through childcare, through case management, through housing. Um, and all of that, we're really um, looking to be doing that alongside a committed employer partner. And so from a training provider's perspective, perspective we are also looking for, um, you know, experience creating customized training curriculums around the needs of an employer and the population that we're serving. So I understand that that is a bit of a mouthful, but, you know, if you feel like your program um, or the pro either a program that you might be including within your um, including within this RFP and submitting as a proposal or something that falls outside of there if you think that this aligns to the work that you're doing uh, we'd love to hear from you so again it's a it's actually a very simple process um, within this um, so I know that this this PDF will be um, submitted to you and um, this should be a link that if you click on it, it takes you to a very short form. It's only three questions um, and essentially just asks who you are and then how your program aligns to this particular work. And if you've 
already submitted proposal, if you will be submitting a proposal that includes an overview of your program, you can also just denote that so we can take a look at the materials that you already submitted so that you don't have to be submitting um, information twice. If you have any questions, um, you know, please feel free to reach out. My email is here. I'd be happy to, to um, assist with that. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, that concludes our presentation for today's Bidders Conference. Again, if you have any questions, you can feel free to ask now. Uh, we can take some more time. Um, we can stay on a little bit more, uh, but proposals are due again on November 22nd, 5 p.m., and please send them to the VSG training email. All this will be also sent to you along with a copy of the, today's recording. Um, and again, FAQs will be posted on Friday. Hey, Zidia, there's one more question from Jason. He asked, um, what is the expectation for the length of training for each cohort? Um, so that also varies with your training program. There, We have some training programs that may last about 20 weeks or more, um, but those are typically self-paced programs. There are also other programs that may last about 16 weeks, which are more hands-on. Um, so it really depends on your program, how long the training runs. Uh, again, these are this funding is to support programs that are already physically operating and, and can take on additional customers uh, rather than programs that are starting from scratch and trying to figure out what are the minor details of this. Sorry, any other questions? I just wanted to remind everyone that we recorded this um, meeting. So this will be posted on our website um, if you wanna go back and look at anything um, or if you know of colleagues, friends that couldn't make it today, feel free to direct them to this recording. Um, and then we will also send out um, a PDF of this PowerPoint so that you have this information as well. Um, just so that you can reference back to anything um, at a later date and time. If there are no other questions, again, we thank you for joining us today, um, and we hope to see your proposal within this RFP cycle. Um, and again, if you have any other questions in regards to the William Penn Foundation grant, please feel free to reach out to Alyssa Tumblr. Um, was also joined us today. Aside from that, you have a little bit of your time back. Uh, thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your afternoon.